Uh, I just saw on your web page that you're like professor of semantic web technologies. So they say. Sounds, <laughs> sounds very cool. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Ruben. Please, the floor for yours. Well, thanks for having me. So I'll tell you about um, Solid, and Solid is the, the new project of web developer Tim Berners-Lee. You might wonder what Solid has to do with ORLC, and so was I some time ago, but in the meantime things have become a bit clearer, so I want to share my thoughts on this with you today. But also it's going to be a bit of a, of a discussion instead of me just, just pushing things up on you. That said, um, the main thing about Solid is Solid is about choice. Um, it is an ecosystem that enables people to use the applications that they want to use on the web without having to give their data away, basically. So you can still store your data wherever you want, as in you do on your local computer, but you can use whatever apps that you need to use. So the idea um, behind Solid is that you own your data, and you can share it with the applications and the people that you choose. Now, this might already sound familiar, because it's not unlike some of the OSLC calls about um, being application dependent and so on. The difference, I think, is that Solid is primarily or at least um, the first incarnation of Solid focuses on empowering people on the web, so individuals, but there's nothing in technology that stops it from also being used for companies, corporations, and, and so on. So I would say similar problem, just a slightly different thing. Today I'll guide you through the Solid ecosystem, um, what it is, what it contains. I'll also explain why link data is so important to us, um, and then I'll talk about the connection that I see with, with, with OSLC. First, before I start, um, the ecosystem, a disclaimer, the examples I'll be giving will be um, in the area of, of social media. But don't confuse Solid with a social media product. It's just an easy example to give you an idea of what Solid can do and to contrast with how things are happening today. But it's not limited to social media in, in any way. They're just my examples. So the starting point of Solid is that uh, online, you're able to store every single piece of data you produce wherever you want. And think about how this is different today. Like this is a view that we're all quite familiar with. It's a social media post. And usually, all of those things are stored in one place, right? We've seen a massive centralization of the web. People can communicate <coughs> online as much as they want, as long as they're on the same platform. Huh? So um, with Solid, this is different. Like every single piece of data you see there can be stored somewhere else. So this is my post, while well, my profile picture is stored in my space. My text is also stored in my space. If you make a comment on my post, well, that comment is yours. It's stored in, in your space. If you make a like on my post, like a piece of data as small as liking something, that like is yours. It's stored in your space. So what we have is a view that is built up with data coming from lots of different places instead of just coming from, from one single space. So you can already guess the kind of technical challenges we have there regard to data integration, also with regard to, to querying and so on, to make sure the data is in the right place at the right time. What does this look like? Well, let's contrast the um, centralized way of thinking that we see today on the web, and again, this is not limited to social media. Let's contrast this with uh, what we want to achieve with the solid ecosystem. So nowadays, an application is basically a combination of data and a service, right? If you think about things like Facebook and LinkedIn, when we say my LinkedIn or my Facebook, uh, we don't only mean the application, we also mean the data that is stored on the application. They're almost used interchangeably, basically. This has a couple of consequences. First of all, from a privacy perspective, of course, we have to give our data away before we can use the service. Now, this is a problem for individuals. It's definitely also a problem for organizations. If you have to give your data to a third party before they give you a service, it will be problematic. I would say that companies probably feel more strongly about this than, than the average person, right? Another problem, of course, is that of data synchronization and, and data sharing. And this is a problem we all know. Like, one system knows about a certain state, but another system doesn't. And we see it right here with social media, of course. I cannot share my Facebook pictures with my LinkedIn colleagues. I either have to move the people or I have to move the data, but they don't just interoperate. And the same thing is true for multiple systems that are using today, obviously. <coughs> So the thing we want to achieve with Solid on the web is that there's no synchronization needed because data is stored with the people. There's only one point of synchronization, so you don't need to sync, basically. And different applications, they access data from different data pods on the web, but every piece of data only has one copy. So this means a couple of things. This means that, first of all, all of my data is up to date, like my calendar doesn't <coughs> need to be synced across applications because there's only one instance of that. 
It also means it becomes easy to switch different service providers. Like if I don't like my social feed application, I can switch another one, and I don't have to move my data because my data stays with me all of the time. And this is what we want to enable on the web. So we want to think about web applications in a way that you keep your own data. But this is, of course, great for people, great for privacy, but the more important thing here, I guess, is it's also really nice for developers. Because what we see today is that we have a very strongly data ownership based competition. Like the party with the most data, they win, and guess what, they've already won. So the competition is kind of dead. And you see this. You see with the big web platforms who have lots of data that they fail to innovate. You don't see a lot of changes happening there because why would they need to innovate? They've already won the competition. It also means that if you're a new player with a new idea on how to do things better, that you have trouble entering the market because you don't have the data. Even if your idea is better, even if your service is better, too bad you can't enter the market. What Solid will realize, if everything works out, is that because people own their data, you get a different kind of dynamic. Here you have a competition that's based on data ownership, here you have two separate competitions. There's a competition between different services, and the competition is based on the quality of service. And interestingly, this is a winner-takes-all competition. There can only be one big player. Whereas here it depends on preferences. My choice of service might not necessarily be your choice of service, but we have the freedom to choose independently what is best for us, and we can still work together. Because interoperability is a fact at the data level, it's not just a locking of the data. Then there will also be a separate competition on, on the data market, and again, also um, service quality, and that might mean different things. And just to give you an idea of how interesting the competition is going to get, I expect that for personal data, there will be three kinds of data pod providers, data space providers. I think some of them will be free, as we have today. You store your data for free, but your data is probably being mined. That's a trade-off that we see today. I also expect there to be paying data providers where you say, look, you store my data, you, you take backups and I will pay you a, a monthly fee and you're not mining my data because it's mine. I also expect some providers to pay people for storing the data there. But if you do that, you know that your data will definitely be mined. But just this is a thought experiment to show you that there's gonna be multiple options here, that this competition is gonna be really important because today we have a lack of competition. Now, also interesting is that the implications this will have on how we build applications. Because right now, what we often see is that web applications, um, in essence, the application-specific logic is responsible for doing requests. So there will be lots of HTTP requests, very specific to a certain um, interface. This is problematic if you think the solid way. Now, why is that? Because first of all, which server should you be contacting? Like, there's not just one server, data can come from, from different places. So, Hard coding for one server already fails. And if we start to contact multiple servers, can we really enforce that they all have the same API? Yes, to a certain extent we can. They will all have the same base API. But I expect that some of them will also offer, let's say, layered compatibility, different kinds of APIs that make certain tasks faster. So depending on the API that's available at runtime, you might want to make different choices. So building applications like this, I think, is, is not going to work anymore because it simply doesn't scale in terms of servers, also just in terms of service and logic and APIs. So what I think will be evolving towards is the client that consists of two parts. On the one hand, there's still the application-specific logic, but the application-specific logic should not be responsible for doing HTTP requests, because they can change at any point. I think clients will need to shift with a query engine, and query, I mean read-write. So any uh, operation with data and the application specific logic will need to be coded as a query, as a read query or a write query. And then it's up to a query engine on the client side to translate it into concrete requests depending on the interfaces that are available on the data spaces. Now, of course, I realize this puts a lot of burden on this component because this is going to be a complex component. But the good thing is that this component is reusable. So you write it once or you've got multiple implementations, you can reuse them across clients. And the other good thing is that the application logic, they can, it can stay constant um, as interfaces change because the queries for data do not change. So we have a more declarative way of interacting with data, which allows us to evolve independently. And even though this, of course, is a more complex client, than the simple client you see there, this is a client that's able to withstand more changes, that's more robust if interfaces change, if data moves. And frankly, I think this is something that we'll need. 
of course, to realize that a lot of standardization will be necessary. So this brings me to Solid. What you've seen now was more the vision of Solid, so let me make a concrete what already exists today, what kind of software uh, do we have. The so Solid is an ecosystem of data and apps that work seamlessly together. We have data paths, data spaces, where people get the stores. We have applications using that, and of course we have standards enabling the exchange between those two. A data pod can store anything, um, like profiles, photos, comments, likes, whatever you can imagine, and applications can also be anything similarly. So it's just a generic data store. Um, and the standards, more interestingly, are HTTP, URL, RDF, LDP is going to be very important, notifications as well. So how should you think of a solid server? Well, it is a space that stores and guards data. But actually, conceptually, it's really simple. A solid web server is just a regular web server. It's basically a file server with LDP on top of that. And on top of LDP, we have authentication, so IBC. Authentication also means access control. So instead of just being an open file system, you have very granular access. <coughs> but that's it, basically. So a solid server is conceptually nothing more than this. This means the server is completely application agnostic, uh, which means that all the logic, of course, needs to be in a class. And what I tell most people is that think of a solid pod as just a regular website. I mean, it's back to the old days of the web, where if you want to publish something, you just put it in your own space instead of having to put it in centralized platforms. The difference being that it's not a website on a page level, it's a website on a data level. So data can be recombined much more flexibly than web pages would be able to. So anything can be in a pod, basically. And um, clients, what do they look like? Well, um, the idea is that you give permission to um, read or write a certain uh, part of your data pod. Um, and you can be very specific about that. Um, people in your network, friends, colleagues, whatever, will do the same thing. And they can also be very precise about that. And then the role of an application is to build a unified experience across different uh, data providers online. So this is basically the uh, conceptual translation of the figure that we've seen so far. So the query figure shows that it needs need to be collecting uh, data on the web. And apps, the idea of apps is that they indeed provide a unified experience on, on top of such data. And again, the same thing as with data. Any app you can envision, you, you can build with solid because it, it's such a generic uh, system. And this is just a consequence of being on the web. Um, now maybe just a word about like what's the state of solid. So solid is an open ecosystem uh, with different parties in there. And recently, um, Interrupt well, was founded by, by Tim Berners-Lee. So um, in addition to having an open ecosystem, there's also a company now in the ecosystem. And we think it's very important um, because someone needs to kickstart an ecosystem, right? It's not just gonna happen if, if everything's open and there's no real competition in there. So we need some active players. So Interrupt will open the ecosystem. We'll also look at maintaining common building blocks as open source. There will be tooling for developers, there will be services of applications, um, and it's basically it. So when you hear about um, Solid, that's the open source ecosystem, Interrupt is a company trying to bootstrap the ecosystem, and what we hope with Interrupt is that it starts competition in that ecosystem, because if we remain the only player in the uh, Solid ecosystem, of course, we have lost. Like The idea is just that there's competition, so that people have choice. So this was about Solid um, in general. Let me have a look at the role that linked data is specifically playing in all of this. So um, linked data, of course, is necessary to solve a couple of crucial challenges that we're facing. How can applications um, share data? How can we connect it together? And how can we integrate data from, from multiple sites? You know? So um, let me just give an example of, I told you that like a simple piece of data, such as a like, you can store it in your own space. So how does it work? Well, it doesn't require a lot of imagination. It's, of course, linked data. This is me liking the OSL Fest website. And notice that I don't need permission to do this. Like, there was no like button on this website. I could just do it because it's a piece of data in, in my pod. And I just connect two things. The other thing, of course, is data shapes. Because I can say that this is a like, but how does an application recognize this? Well, this is because we, we will suggest some shapes that, that different applications will, will use. And this is similar to, of course, the standards that we have with OLC. But I think that we should go beyond shapes as well. And this might be an interesting point of, of discussion. Because if we just prescribe exactly what, what data should look like, we're not really using RDF. We are using linked data because we're connect things together. 
But if you just say like data needs to be fixed, then you might as well be using JSON with links, like there wouldn't be a difference. And I think that if we use reasoning at some point in the future, we'll be able to bridge different choices in the vocabulary. I think right now it makes sense to say, look, if you publish this kind of data, you need to subscribe to this kind of shape. But in the future, applications might be able to choose their shapes more flexibly, and you might be able to convert one into the other, because semantics is the other important part of um, RDF and relation to, to linking. Important here is that the compatibility is layered. So this means that not all applications have to agree about everything. If my application is doing people and photos, it's sufficient for me to just implement those parts of the specification. Basically. So I don't have to look at everything, I don't have to understand everything. I can selectively mix and match the parts that I need, and hopefully through reasoning we can reduce the number of specs we need to depend on. Maybe. And the final thing that LinkedIn is important for is integration. Because if you will be collecting different pieces of data from the web, how can we put them together? With the RDF, it's really simple. You just concatenate them. These are two different likes, and when I put them together, they also make sense. So this is seemingly trivial, but actually quite important for RDF the fact that you can integrate likes. Something interesting, I think, maybe concern that you've also heard. Like, okay, semantic web, who wants to use that? Are developers still excited about this? Familiar concern or not? Apparently not. I've heard it a lot. Um, my answer to that is that the current generation of developers are not burdened by things of the past. Like the, the semantic web used to be this very complex XML thing. We've come, come a long way. And what I see from application developers is they're not concerned too much about technology. They just want to build nice things. And with things like, like Solid, you don't need a lot of data to build nice things. So developers can actually get quite enthusiastic about link data precisely because of this. Like, hey, do you know that you can just collect data from the web? You don't have to collect it from users. You don't have to harvest it first. So here's a couple of ideas that we have to make it easier for developers to work with link data. Basically, we want to have, have them build link data apps without needing to really know RDF in depth. And one way to do this is we could just create object-oriented abstractions, just like a data layer, and then you could just pretend that things are objects. However, if we do that, we kind of hide the benefits of laying data, we hide the flexibility. So just those abstraction layers, you build us another big fan, because then you have like zero of the advantages with all of the drawbacks. So I'm thinking of, um, and that's one of the roles that I have learned in Solid, how can we make development fun? How can we give different kind of developer experiences that are linked data, but not necessarily heavily RDF? And I want to find a way to encourage developers to think in graphs, not to think in objects. So here's one thing. Um, so this is JavaScript. This is an application that we run in a browser. And what we do is something that looks like this. So instead of having to create an RDF graph, we give them expressions like person of friends of first name. And this looks like an object-oriented wrapper, but actually it's not. This is a dynamic object that is resolved at runtime. So basically, there's no object in memory that, that has a persons and friends and first name. This is a disguised query. And you can do things like, give me, for instance, the name of a person, give me the name of all that person's friends. But what's very important is that things like these, they're just semantic or syntactic sugar, in fact. Because behind the same expression is actually Sparkle query being executed. It's just that we want to avoid that developers have to know this, that they have to know Spark, we have to write a query, and have to put this into a query engine. We want them to just write expressions. And notice how this, in essence, is still linked data. It's, there's a person, give me their friends, give me their names. So they're thinking about links, but they don't have to think about RDF. And these kind of things can be important. A final example is, um, how, how do applications uh, look like? Well, this is, for instance, a React application that uses those expressions, where you say, like, hey, user, if you're logged in, I'm going to show you your first name. And this user's the first name is actually Spark the query running behind the scenes. So hiding this complexity can be very useful in getting applications developed really fast. And if you want to know linked data, and if you want to know RDF, it's still possible, but you don't have to to build simple things. And I think things like that are important to talk about. Which brings me to the final part, what does all of this mean um, for um, OSLC? And to explain this, I'm um, actually um, go back to a presentation that I haven't made myself, but that Axel has made. He's given this um, just last month. 
And I picked a couple of slides from it to show you that, hey, maybe we're doing very similar things. So he was explaining that we have a problem connecting data, right? The same thing happens on the web, except that we have a very strong silo effect, where yes, if you wanted to connect data from Facebook, you could, but all data is, is in places, and they don't often give you those sockets to just get your data out. Like they give you a socket if you're really good, if you're not, and you have to play with their terms. And this was a familiar problem. Um, and I also liked what was this slide about data as universal asset, like, hey, we should just have a socket like that. We just tap into it, and then it works. And this to me is the idea of a data pod. Like, you have your own data, an application just is a connector, you have a socket, and then it works. So this kind of vision is very similar and so on. But then it gets very striking as uh, there were like four key IDs. One of them is a standard API. Same thing, LD enables it. So that's something we have in common. The other thing is global identifiers. We use URLs, so this is something that we also have in common apparently. Even more striking is that you want to make connections across <coughs> silos. Same thing, linked data, we also want to do that. And then, this was the most striking thing, it's also about decoupling applications from data, which is the very essence of, of Solid, like the fact that applications are decoupled so you can easily switch providers to this competition. So all of these ideas seem to be very, uh, very light. And then at the end, he said, you should all come to uh, OSLC Fest, which is why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so the way I see it is that, um, how can we connect Solid and, and, and OSLC? What needs to be done? Because um, we have very similar problems. Granted, we have different angles, but technology-wise, that doesn't really make a difference, I would say. Standards. We care a lot about standards because we come from a W3C background, um, and, and basically SOLID is just a collection of LDP, LDM, and a couple of other standards, and some small pieces of glue to make them work together. But otherwise, it's just standards. We're not reinventing the wheel, as many other decentralized companies or organizations are trying to do, just roll their own stack. No, we want to build on top of the existing web standard. LDP, we both use it as it's basically. And the decoupling of applications from data is also very interesting. So basically, with all this together, um, I wonder what are we waiting for? How, how, do, how do you connect these kind of things? Um, and concretely, I'm thinking like maybe um, existing uh, OSLC platforms can be solar providers, and this probably already works given that they implement LDP. Maybe the data that, we're, that we'll be having with solid will be very useful to tap into applications. Um, and the fact that we're focusing on different domains shouldn't stop us because, yes, I gave the example about um, social media, but the same thing holds for, for many professional applications as well. Like, we expect employees to be using their data pods at work. Because, um, and this is also important, the way we see it is that like, Facebook is about having one platform for billions of people. Then there's intermediate solutions like Mastodon, where there's a couple of thousand servers for a couple of thousand people each, for instance. Solid is not just one data space per person, it's even multiple data spaces per person. I can have a data space at home, at the office, at the university, so all of those different spaces are important. And I think there's at least a couple of those spaces that are very relevant for OSLC as well. Um, so basically, um, I look forward to having a nice discussion with you. And, and I think that given that we're, we're so aligned, that there must be a couple of things we can look together. So I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. <coughs> Thank you. Something we discussed yesterday, we were, we were waiting for a business case, right? Uh, because I, I mean, we have that today, right? Because I have on my iPhone many apps that can access data from different sources like iCloud or Dropbox or Microsoft, but not the only metric to make the creating code cheaper or more reuse or something like that. That's not that because if there is a business case, people will overcome that. There will be engineering done to. Um, use all those different APIs like Dropbox, I don't, I don't know. <coughs> and um, I think that is more or less the, the success factor is finding business case, like, like the driver what is the incentive for the user. I'm very happy about that remark because obviously, and I should have started with that, um, <laughs> the technical challenge are not the biggest ones. Exactly, that's <laughs> what I wanted to say. Fortunately, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm only concerned about the technical ones, but the um, <laughs> yeah. But they're the easy ones, in fact. And I think, we do need a technological burden of proof, like, like we need to show that it works, but indeed, um, 
those things are important. And to just answer on, on the content itself, um, what I believe in strongly is, is the, the, the competition, the, the separate markets that I think are very crucial. Because I, since people, I mean, from the moment people know that I'm working on these things, I have had companies come to me like, hey, this is cool because we don't want to own data. We have our core business, which is algorithms for this or that. So um, they want to work in, in, in that way. But um, I think the focus on, on developers is kind of important um, for the ecosystem because it was a conscious decision with Interrupt not just to go there and say, hey, we're in, in this space and we will make things for people. Because if we do that, um, we probably will be making the wrong things. Our first focus is on enabling developers to build things for people. And um, very important there is that um, there's this new generation of developers that didn't really exist five years ago, which are front-end developers. And they're a totally different breed of people. They think in totally different ways. For them, it's important things are easy, that they're fun to work with. And so what we hope to do is, is step into this very creative community, that they will just start building things, and that they will be reaching end users. So I guess summarizing this by focusing on the development experience. We're enabling ourselves to build things, but we're enabling a whole new group of, of people to do things. And for the kind of application that we're focusing on, we believe this is going to be very important. Now, with regard to business models, um, I think that um, the good thing is that given everything that has happened, um, I expect that the people will be more conscious in their decisions. If you remember what I was explaining about, like, hey, maybe providers will even start paying you to give your data. Then people, I guess, will think more like, hey, wait. I think people will be more conscious of the decision, so I think there is room for paying applications and, and so on. I definitely think that that will happen, and, and the choice will kind of enable that. And the final thing, and then I'll stop rambling, is um, I agree about that current applications already have uh, integrations, but of course, just very important to underline the integrations we're talking about here are on data level, not on document level and so on, because like high level integrations on a file level, I think we've seen enough, and, and that kind of works. But the kind of integrations we need, I think, need to be much deeper. And that by itself also taps into a totally different kind of ecosystem because just storing files has been done many times. But the moment you start storing pieces of data and changing these, yeah. I think that by itself will just... I mean, it didn't mean that that, that, that is sure. ready, just, but sure, it, sure. It's, people yeah. are doing that. They are doing yeah. different APIs if there is some incentive for doing that. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. Yes. I mean, I agree that we need the business data. I think what, what I like with this is that you seem to be building a platform, which I think is missing in the OpenSea community. We're still building small adapters and trying to have little products, but you're trying to build something, so I assume, right? So that other people are going to build that, that their own sort of sites and servers and et cetera. And what we would need is, is also that kind of sort of infrastructure support. Like, you know, you're building an open source part, part yeah. and I think that, that's the kind of thing we can probably help out, because I feel for lead data, there is not, there's a lot in the semantic web community, but when it comes to link data for enterprise, we're struggling to find like sort of, you know, other, like more enterprise level technologies to use. To be very specific, it's not just one platform, we hope to have multiple. So it's not mm -hmm. about the ecosystem, we want to put the first platform in there and so on, but we hope there will be different ones. But need such a platform as a starting point seems very important. And interestingly, the competition there will help as well because the kind of platforms we need for individuals are very different from the kind of CD transfer platforms. And we need that state of mind, we need platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I know about Solid um, separately. And the push for owning your data is very strong, equally among consumers but also enterprises, as you mentioned. What I find a bit unresolved yet is the logic of the application. So application vendors want to have revenue stream as we discussed. Um, and in the model of Solid, uh, the logic uh, resides on the client, which is usually a web browser. Um, how can vendors adopt a Solid model of having, basically letting users control their data while having proprietary code um, and earning money on on the algorithm, as you said before. Well, there's two different ways, broadly speaking, and so it doesn't enforce one or, or the other. So, and one of them is indeed that the application con comes to the data, right? The other one is that the application stays where it is and asks permission to see specific parts of data. So, I mean, it is still possible that data goes with companies, and. In that sense, we also need to distinguish between technical and legal challenges. 
Like the difference that we're doing here is, okay, data is stored on premise where it belongs, but it's possible that for certain tasks, it leaves the premises and can get it back. So the fact that an application can only see specific parts of data pods is a technical matter. The fact that they don't keep a copy of the data when they're done, that's a legal matter. That's something we can enforce. So such scenarios will still exist. And in and, and the first case where you say no data does not leave the premises at all, then you need to think about things like encrypted virtual machines and so on. So like it's, it's shipping um, programs to, to the data. So and those things already exist as well. For instance, um, GitHub has enterprise solutions where they just go and deploy their stuff in your data center. You cannot touch their bugs, but it, it works. So those things are possible. And I think given the GDPR and so on, those things are probably the most feasible. Right? You just have software running, you exactly see what goes in and what comes out, and, and you don't have to worry about it. And last question. It may. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, uh, you, each application stores data in a different way, also for optimization reasons. So how hard it will be to add one source where the data is stored in a certain way for all these applications to work properly? Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, so link data, at first, is for information exchange. Right? And this is sometimes, I think, a mistake that we've made in the semantic app community, which is, OK, everything is triple stores, like link data everywhere. I'm not sure. Link data for exchange, I fully agree with. Um, but internally, there's many different formats you, you might want, especially if you're doing machine learning and so on, you can do machine learning on, on, on triples. Mm -hmm. um, what is important in this whole concept is that it's not because there, that there's one data store um, that it cannot be caches. Right? And caching is going to be very important to make it scale, but also for things like this. And when we have caches, those caches can also store data in, in the different formats. So this ultimately is a matter of the source of truth. Like, in what I'm saying when I say one data pod, I mean it is one source of truth. I don't mean that there cannot be copies, that there cannot be copies in different formats. It's just that whenever there's a doubt, whenever a resolution needs to happen, you need to go back to the single source. Um, so the answer to that is, yeah, yes, there will be copies of the data, there will be cached, there will be different formats, um, but they will not be sourced, they will be copies, and, and that's the important thing there. I think we are uh, going to stop here and uh, Ruben, thank you very much for also thinking about the, the fun component, you know, because sometimes as engineers and researchers, <laughs> we're like a bit too focused on the features and we forget about the, the fun part. So sometimes we have to remind ourselves that it's also like, yeah. uh, like a driving force for us huh? to innovate and disrupt a bit the system. Can, can yeah. I get a small sneak peek there? We yeah. have a talk about GraphQL later today. And this was for me an eye-opening experience. Like a couple of months ago, I was at a GraphQL conference with a room full of front-end developers. Mm -hmm. And there are people who just want to have fun and do cool things, and they're even proud that they're bad programmers. So there's a different way of thinking about this. And I think like innovations like these will be very important to make all this work. Thank you again. Um, well, yes, we're going to be using shackles uh, for that. Um,